We can't buy them or take them or steal them. They are already ours. There's another reason why this might be a parable. It has a lid. And sometimes parables seem to have lids on them. But when you lift the lid of a parable, there's something very precious inside. I know. Let's take the lid off and see if this is a parable. I wonder what this could be. Oh, it's so green and it's kind of shaped like a square. It could be a blanket or maybe a rug. Let's see if there's some more. This looks like a table. Once there was someone who said such amazing things and did such wonderful things that people began to follow him. As they followed, he told them about a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, but they did not understand. They had never been to such a place and they didn't know anyone who had. So one day he said, the kingdom of heaven is like this. Once a person invited many people to a great feast. When the feast was ready, the servant said to the guest, Come, for all now is ready. But they all made excuses. The first said, I just bought a field, and I must go check on it. Please excuse me. The second said, I just bought five yoke of oxen, and I have to go and try them out. Please excuse me. And the third one said, I just got married, so I cannot come. Please excuse me. When the servant told his master, he said, Go quickly to the streets and alleys of the city and bring the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame, but still there was room. 
go out to the highways and roads and get people to come so my house will be filled. I wonder how it felt to be invited to this great feast. I wonder if these people have names. I wonder why these people came and others wouldn't. I wonder how the master feels about the guests. I wonder how the guests feel about the master. Let's pray. Hands together in our laps, heads bowed. Dear God, thank you for providing for us. Thank you for inviting us to the great feast. May we always have food in our belly and a song in our heart. May we always be inviting of others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Hospitable God, you invite us to a banquet where the first may be last, and the humble and the mighty may trade places. And yet, God, we often miss that we've received your invitation. 
or we simply don't care to respond to what you offer us. Lord, we confess to you that oftentimes we feel overlooked and we feel underappreciated. A part of us wants some glory and some recognition, and sometimes our foolish pride is getting in the way of our own heart. Pride comes forward and incites in us envy and pettiness and gossip and vanity and a lot of other things that we are better without. So help us, O Lord. Help us to, in humility, reach out in trust and believe that you value us no matter who we are or what we have done. Lord, help us to turn our hearts and our minds around so that we may find a place at your table and welcome others with radical hospitality. In the name of Jesus, the honored host at all of our tables, we pray in song as he taught us to pray, saying, words from the Gospel of Matthew. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned the city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? He was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You are welcome. Welcome to this holy table. Yes, you are welcome. You are welcome here. So, so this is the parable of the wedding banquet. And let me just start by saying what everybody was thinking when you heard this scripture just a second ago. We don't like this one. <laughs> this is one of those hard teachings from Jesus that we would just rather skip over. And most of the time we do. We like to hear about how much God loves us. We often want to be affirmed that we 
All we need is to be, believe in Jesus and everything's fine. That's the gospel. That's the good news, right? But sometimes we forget or choose to ignore the fact that the gospel story is also a challenging story. Calling us out of our present existence and into a greater way of being. For example, Jesus talked more about money and riches and how we should give it away than anything else other than the kingdom of God. And how many of us take those teachings seriously? Most of us just give enough but don't ever take that life-altering step to give sacrificially, right? In the same way, we like to picture ourselves living for eternity in God's favor but choose to ignore the fact that we must actually live different lives if we're going to be Christ followers. Now, before I go on, I want you to understand something about Scripture. It wasn't written as Scripture. That, that's a hard one for people to understand. Scripture wasn't written as Scripture. Scripture was written a couple of centuries after Jesus or a couple of decades after Jesus, or four or five or six or seven. But it didn't become scripture until the church committee put it, made it that way some three or four hundred years later. Each book was written for a certain community. And we understand that with Paul's letters because Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Or Paul wrote to the church in Rome. But the Gospels were also written for a specific group of people, for a specific purpose. You know, the, this parable also shows up in the Gospel of Luke, and I want you to hear the differences. Hear these words from Luke. Jesus said, someone gave a great dinner and invited many people. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slaves out and to, say, to say to those who he invited, come, everything is now ready. But they all began to make excuses. The first one said, I have bought a piece of land and I have to go and s go out and see it and accept the, my regrets. I can't come, so accept my regrets. And another one said, well, I just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to have to try them out and work with them. Please, please accept my regrets. And another said, you know, I just got married this weekend myself and I can't come to accept my regrets. So the slave returns back to the master and reports this and the owner of the house got irritated. He got mad and he said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the town and bring in the poor and the cripple and the blind and the lame. And the slave said, Sir, what you order has been done, but there's still room. So the master said to the slave, we'll go out into the roads and the lanes and compel people to come in so that my house is filled. For I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste of my dinner. Do you notice what's missing in this parable? As Luke records it, uh, there's no mention of, of seizing or mistreating the master's servants. There's no mention of the people killing the master's servants. And there's also no mention of the master sending out his army to destroy those people and burning down their city. Now, clearly this is an embellishment of the parable, parable on the part of Matthew. And it changes the meaning of the text. Most commentators suggest that the addition of death and destruction in the Gospel of Matthew is in reference to the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in about 70 AD. As such, Matthew turns this parable into a message against the Jewish people who've refused to acknowledge Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. And although this may have been an interpretation by the early church, I don't find it helpful especially in light of continued anti-Semitism, and especially since Jesus was a Jew. 
In Luke's version of this story, those invited did not simply make light of the invitation to attend. That they, they didn't harm the master's servants. They actually gave what considered to be legitimate excuses for not coming and sending regrets. As a result, the point of the parable centers on the invited guests focusing more on their own concerns than what they believed was more important. They thought their needs were more important than, than the kings, than the masters. Now, since Jesus' parables are teachings about the kingdom of God, the message may be that God, out of God's benevolent grace, is inviting us into his kingdom and throwing a party. But because our earthly concerns, we fail to behold the significance of God's invitation. And we don't respond. Now I'll get back to this in a minute, but I want to talk a little bit about who the king did end up inviting when the original guest didn't show up. That they were outsiders. Outsiders by faith, outsiders by culture, outsiders definitely by social class. They were people like Matthew, the tax collector, Zacchaeus, the Samaritan woman at the well, the Phoenician woman, or the woman caught in adultery. They were lepers. They were Romans. Do we, as followers of Jesus, invite Everyone. The new guests were extended an invitation that they never would have expected. Both the good and the bad were invited in the wedding hall until it was filled. They were invited from the streets and the street corners. They were sinners in need of a savior. And unlike the original guests, they knew it. Matthew 9 says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Paul echoes the same point uh, in Galatians when he says there's neither Greek nor Jew, slave or free, male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. So although they were sinners and, and Gentiles and people of different social class, they didn't insult the king like the original guests had. What should our guest list look like? Consider this story about this woman who lived in a small New England town. She did an unusual thing to celebrate her birthday. She and her husband had been visiting this town for 20 some years on vacation. And when they retired, they decided to move there. But her husband died about a year after they moved there. And all they had often joked at the way they were still regarded as townspeople as the summer folk, the woman had not been aware how rigid that was until she was left alone. True, she knew most of the inhabitants of the, of the town as acquaintances and was treated politely enough, but she realized that because she'd not been born there, she was simply not one of them and was never really accepted. She knew that it was not deliberate, but she just wasn't included. Her birthday came around again, and instead of moping around and being lonely, she decided that she'd do something different this year. She'd throw a party, and she would invite the people that nobody else would think about inviting. Instead of inviting everybody the right people she would she would thought about this and she would go and look at for people who, and who had different and unusual circumstances and she almost laughed to herself she's putting this guest list together there was the the dark-skinned portuguese woman with such broken english at the bakery that she'd met almost you know two or three times there was the blind woman whose family had all moved out of town and seldom ever contacted her there was that new young school teacher in town, but who was too shy to make friends. There was that divorcee with the two kids who had come to town from the city, but lived on welfare and was the topic of a lot of gossip around the town. There was the 
mother who was a widow that everybody knew had a drinking problem. And there was the wife of the new man who was in charge of the Coast Guard station out there. Who would ever think about including them in anything? So she decided to send them invitations to her party. And they all came, all of them. Everyone had the best time they had had in years. And in fact, they agreed that they were going to start meeting every month. Next month was going to be in the tiny house of the Portuguese woman. Doesn't this story give us a mirror image of what God intends for us to do in filling this wedding hall with guests? That, that leads to the next problem in Matthew's version of this story, though. Let, let me reread that last part of Matthew's text. It says, but when the king came in and saw the guests, he noticed there was a man over there not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without the right clothes on? man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him out in the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Say what? You pull people off the street and then you complain they're not wearing the right color tux? You've got to be kidding. However, we read this in English in today's perspective. But in Jesus' time, it would not have been uncommon for the father of the bride to give everyone attending the wedding a garment to wear appropriate for the occasion. To be invited to a wedding banquet by a king and be given a garment to wear and then show up not wearing it would not only be a sign of disrespect to the king, It'd be a sign of rebellion. And it would be a prideful stance to say that the clothes that I have are better than the ones you gave me. According to Matthew, this parable is telling us that unless we are wearing the garment that God has given us, then there isn't anything you can do, anything you can wear, anything you can say that will be sufficient so that the king would permit you to stay. So what garment has God given us? What does the Lord require of us? You know, the, my favorite scripture in the Old Testament, the prophet Micah. Um, and by the way, this Micah 6 text, uh, Rabbi Abby Jacobson is going to be preaching for us towards the end of November. But the prophet Micah says that we are called to make justice happen. We are called to love with kindness as God loves us. And we are to walk humbly with God as we reflect God's image on this earth. And then one of my favorite scriptures in the New Testament from Colossians, Paul says, since you have been chosen, this is from the message, by the way, since you have been chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you, compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength and discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the Master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment. It's never be without it. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other, in step with each other. None of this going off and doing your own thing. And cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing. Sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your lives, your words, your actions, whatever, be done in the name of Jesus, thanking God every step of the way. But we're reading the Gospel of Matthew. So maybe we ought to hear what Matthew has to say about what, how we should clothe ourselves. The 25th chapter of Matthew, we hear these words of what God wants from us. 
When the Son of Man comes in His glory and with all His angels with Him, He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats, putting the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right hand, Come, you that are blessed to be by My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. And I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it we saw you a stranger and welcomed you? Or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison or visited you? And the king will answer, Truly I tell you, just as you did it for the least of these, you did it to me. If we say that we are disciples first, if we say that we follow in the way of Jesus, then we have to come to the party clothed in righteousness. It has nothing to do with what you're wearing on your skin and everything to do with what you're wearing on the inside. Everyone is invited. Everyone is called to love all the people. So let's party, people. My RSVP says that here at Disciples First, we respect and serve various people. We got our party clothes on, and I can't wait. I can't wait till we can come together and be in this room together again. But until then, you are invited to party at home, to love and to live and to give in a way that others can experience God's abundant love. You are welcome here. Amen. Come to the table of grace. Come to the table of love. This is God's table. It is not yours or mine. Come to the table of joy. We come today to remember that Jesus calls us 
to welcome one another. Welcome everyone to the table. As we remember the bread broken, his body, the cup, his blood poured out, let us remember what he taught us to love one another and to share that love with the world. Let us partake in the table of love. Come to the table of joy. Come to the table of joy. This is God's table. It's not yours or mine. Come to the table of joy. Now at this time, we once again recognize that we are in this ministry together. This service of the Lord, this dedication of our lives to the kingdom of God, to the doing of God's will and the sharing of God's love. So we remind you once again that we have several ways to contribute to the ministry of this congregation so that good things can continue to happen and even greater things in our future. We can contribute to our ministry through the Givelify method. And you will find uh, information about that coming up on your screen. You may also contribute by sending a check to our mailing address, and you'll see that information as well. We want to make this a ministry together. And so let us be in full participation with gladness of heart and oneness of purpose to follow Christ as his disciples. And as we recognize that, we want to seal the deal by singing a song together, I'm going to eat at the welcome table. May we rejoice as we sing, and may we take seriously who we are and whose we are as we sing in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to eat at the welcome table. I'm going to eat at the welcome table. Hallelujah. I'm going to eat at the welcome table. I'm going to eat at the welcome table. Hallelujah. I'm going to eat and eat with my Jesus. I'm going to eat and eat. Oh, 
fine musicians in this place. Amen. Amen. Let us go from this place with a song in our hearts, sharing God's love with each and every person you meet. Amen. As we come to the conclusion of our service today, we are reminded of Christ's banquet. Daniel is going to sing a song to close us out today called Feed Us Now. Bread of life in this holy meal let us know your love anew. We hunger for you. Feed us now, bread of life. Come and live within. Let your peace be ours today. Lord Jesus, we pray. We are disciples first. We are called to follow in the way of Jesus. We are called to share God's love no matter what because we've been given the clothes to wear and we are ready to wear them and share God's special love with the world. Ministry is still happening here and we can still use your financial gifts. You can go and send a check through the P.O. box or you can go to the church's website and you can give through Givelify. Let God's love show. Let God's love be heard. Amen.